There are many beautiful equations within mathematics. Probably the most commonly cited one is Euler's equation e to the i pi plus 1 equal to 0 that combines five of the special numbers in mathematics. But in this video, I want to make a case for a different equation to be on any short list for the most beautiful equation in mathematics. This one is also due to Euler. It is the Euler product formula. Now, don't let the notation scare you. The big sigma just refers to the sum of a bunch of terms. The big pi refers to the product of a bunch of terms. The sum here is taken over all natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and so forth. So you get terms like one over one to the s, one over two to the s, one over three to the s, all added together. However, the product is multiplying for all p's that are primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so forth. And so you get terms like 1 over 1 minus 2 to the minus s, 1 over 1 minus 3 to the minus s, and so forth. So the first reason that I really love this formula so much is just that it's really surprising. Why would a product of terms only dealing with primes be related to a sum of terms that are now dealing with all of the numbers. That seems very strange. And that this strange relationship comes out with only very basic mathematical operations, addition, multiplication, division, and so forth, makes it even more surprising. Now, it's worth noting that this equation has a parameter s on both sides. s can be many numbers, like for example, I could plug in the specific value of s equal to 2, and when I do it, this equation actually adds up to something. It converges to the number pi squared over 6. So for any of you who think that any candidate for a beautiful math equation better have a pi in it, well, okay, we have a pi in this one. But s doesn't have to equal just 2. It could be many different things. But it can't be anything. Because I'm taking an infinite sum, I need to ask, when does this converge? And for those of you who might remember your first year calculus, this summation on the left hand side, it converges precisely when s is greater than 1. If you plug in s equal to 1 specifically, you get the harmonic series, 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, and infamously, that series diverges. So if I'm only considering real numbers and they're greater than 1, then it's going to converge and make sense. And as we're going to see later in the video, you could actually also put in complex values for s, which is going to open the door to a really deep field of mathematics. And there's even a million dollar millennium problem hiding around in there, which we'll get to a little bit later in the video. But we're not there yet. Okay, so my third reason that I really like this is that it just has a lovely proof. You might have heard before about the sieve of Eratosthenes. Let me just put up all the numbers between, say, 2 and 100. And I'm going to try and filter these. First, I'm going to notice that 2 is a prime number, and I'm going to get rid of all of the multiples of 2. Gone. Then I'm going to take the next number on the list that hasn't been filtered out, which is 3. 3 is also prime, and if I filter out all the multiples of 3, 3 and 6, which was already filtered, but it now filters new ones like 9 and 15 as well. So that filtered out you know, roughly two-thirds of the numbers. The, the next number that I haven't filtered already is 5. 5 is prime. I can filter that out, then at 7, I can filter out 7. And notice what happens here. All the numbers between 2 and 10 have been filtered out. And 10 is interesting because 10 is the square root of 100. If I wanted to factor some other number between 10 and 100, one of those factors would have to be less than 10. And because I've filtered out everything up to the square root of the number I'm considering, the square root of 100 in this case, every other number that I have not shaded in is now prime. So I can come through one by one and shade all of those in as well. All of those unshaded ones are going to be prime in addition to 2, 3, 5, and 7. This was a sieve of Eratosthenes. So we're going to use this idea in the proof of Euler's product formula. Okay, so where were we? Uh, here is our summation. And I'm going to give it a shorthand so that I can sort of refer to this nice and cleanly. I'm going to give it the shorthand zeta of s. It's a function of the parameter s. And the common name for it is the, the Riemann zeta function, so I use the symbol zeta for it. This is just going to allow me to ma manipulate it. Let's imagine I'm working with an s where this thing converges. I can do a little bit of trickery. Let me take this zeta function and multiply it by 1 over 2 to the s. 
if I look at all the terms in my sequence and I bring in the one over two to the s, this has the effect of making everything multiply by two. So my denominators become one over two to the s, one over four to the s, one over six to the s, all evens. Okay, let's take the top and subtract it from the bottom. In other words, what I'm considering is one minus one over two to the s times the zeta function. When I took the zeta function, divided it by two to the s, this meant that everything on the bottom was even. And so if I subtract this, all the even ones go away, like one over two to the s gets subtracted from both sides, one over four to the s, and so forth. So what I'm left with only has odds on the bottom, three to the s, five to the s, and seven to the s. Okay, well, let's keep going. Let's take that expression. I can do the same kind of trickery to it. I'm going to multiply now by the next prime, one over three to the s. So kind of like how I filtered by twos, now I'm filtering by threes. You do that, my denominators become, well, multiples of three. Three, nine, 15, 21. It's not all the multiples of three because we've already filtered some of them out, right? So, so six wouldn't be there because we already got rid of the even ones. But I'm left with these multiples of three. And then I can do the same trick, top minus bottom. So this is gonna give me one minus one over three to the s times this previous expression. And well, I filtered out all of the multiples of three from the bottom. So I have a five to the s, a seven to the s, an 11 to the s, but, but no multiples of two, no multiples of three. Okay, I, I can keep on going and, and filtering along. The next one will be one minus one over five to the s that gives rid of all the multiples of five. And so again, my, my sort of picture brings us up to this spot in the sieve of Eratosthenes. I filtered out the twos, the threes, the fives. My next step would be the sevens, then the elevens, then the thirteens, and so forth. And so if I keep on doing this, multiplying by factor after factor after factor, and I just do that for all of the primes, then what I'm going to get is that the product of all the primes of expressions that look like this, one minus one over a prime number to the s, you know, two, three, five, and so forth. Well, on the right hand side, I've gotten rid of the twos, the threes, the fives. If I keep on going, getting rid of all these prime numbers, the only thing that's gonna survive is the value of one. And so this product of primes times this zeta function is equal to one. Then to capture the formula, it's just a matter of dividing through. And so I will put this expression onto the other side. And this gives me that zeta of s is the product of one over one minus p to the minus s. And then reminding ourselves of what the zeta function was, I get Euler's product formula. Now I want to emphasize that the proof sketch that I just gave, it really only works when you have convergence. So this idea only works when you have convergence. And again, this converges for real numbers of s greater than one. Okay, fourth reason why I love this formula. It, it's about what we can get out of it. Now, you might remember that the fact that there's infinitely many prime numbers is something that humanity has known for a very long time. I've done a previous video before on Euclid's uh, infamous proof that there were in fact infinitely many primes going back to the time of the ancient Greeks. But Euler's proof of his product formula, this is going back to the 1700s now, actually gives us a way to not only reprove that there's infinitely many primes, but to extend beyond that and get some more glimpses about how many primes there really are. To do this, I really want to imagine what's gonna happen in the s equal to one case. And I'll remind you that if I were just to plug in s equal to one as I, you know, sort of naively written the formula down on the page here, well, this is the harmonic series and it diverges. But I wanna study the right-hand side and see what that implies about this particular product, the, the product of one over one minus p to the minus one. What happens if you happen to plug in s equal to one? More faithfully, what we should be doing is taking the limit as s approaches one from above. I'm gonna take that product formula and I'm gonna take the logarithm of it. And I know some of you don't like logarithms, that's okay. I love logarithms because they allow me to take products and convert a product into a summation. The logarithm of the product of two things is the sum of the two logarithms. And so using logarithms, I get to convert this into a summation. I've also taken an exponent to the power of minus one and brought it out the front as a minus sign, another log rule. Okay, lovely. And then there's one more cool log rule I get to exploit here, which is the power series for what logarithm is. So I'll remind you that we have the series expansion for the logarithm of one plus x. It's x minus x squared over two plus x cubed over three and so forth. So looking at what I have, where I've got all these logarithm terms of one minus p to the minus one, I'm gonna call that negative p to the minus one, that's gonna be my value of x. And so 
I can take this logarithm and expand it out as a series. So if I, I do that, okay, remember there's the negative all the front, because the x I'm choosing is negative, all the odd powers bring out a negative, all the even powers already have a negative. So everything's negative and with the negative at the front, they're all positive. Nevertheless, I get this sum. And a common thing that you see when you're doing the kind of series expansions is you wanna make some sort of argument the higher order terms don't matter. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But in this particular case, the higher order terms don't matter. That, that actually everything from the second term onwards, you add all of those up together, this is all small, like you can bound it by a number like, for example, one half. If you don't mind, I'll leave this slightly technical point to the interested viewer who could uh, debate about it in the comments, or I'll, uh, I'll leave a link to an answer in the description if you're so interested. But the point is it doesn't matter, it, it's irrelevant. So going back to where we were at the beginning, remember what we were trying to do was we had this divergent harmonic series, and at, at least in the limit as f was going to one from the right, we were trying to compare that to the product that we're studying. Taking logarithm doesn't affect whether something diverges or not. So ultimately, if we're wanting this product to diverge, it must be the case that just the sum of one over p, one over the primes, has to diverge. And having taken that little detour, we get to the big moment here, which is that the sum of the reciprocal primes diverge. Now, now this, well, First of all, it gives us that there's infinitely many primes. Like if there was only a finite number of primes, there's no way we, you know, this would ever add up to infinity. So, so first of all, we've captured that. But it does more. It tells us something about the density of primes that there's sort of enough of them to get this divergence. And for example, you could compare this to something else. Like remember before we saw the, the, the reciprocal squares, one over n squared, and we saw that that added up to pi squared over six? And so the point here is that square numbers are pretty rare, such that when you add up the reciprocals of them, they manage to converge. But primes are not that rare. They're sort of the density of them isn't that bad. You add up the reciprocal primes and it does diverge to infinity. So yes, there's infinitely many primes and yes, those primes get sparser and sparser the larger the numbers are, but they never go so sparse that you don't have this divergence. Now, trying to understand the distribution of primes leads to some of the deepest parts of mathematics. And this is where the Euler product formula is really a doorway into an entire branch of mathematics called analytic number theory. Remember how earlier in the video we were talking about the, the zeta function, z of s here, and I noted that this only works for real numbers where s is greater than one. Okay, what if I allowed complex values for s? And one can show that the result that we knew that s had to be greater than one for real numbers extend to the complex numbers to be that the real component of s needs to be greater than one. So it's okay to treat this as a complex function. But, but now it gets tricky. What mathematicians do is they say, well, there's a whole bunch of complex numbers where the real component is not going to be greater than one. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have this function extended into that domain? And there's an incredibly powerful trick within mathematics called analytic continuation that allows these functions to be extended into the complex plane. Now, I'm actually not gonna do in this video an entire explainer on this. There's a lovely old one by three, blue, one brown that I'll put a link to down in the description. If you wanna kinda of like visualize what this analytic continuation looks like. But for our purposes, I just want you to imagine that this function which only converged in a certain range is, is being extended now to apply to many other places. You might, for instance, have heard of this infamous thing, like what happens if you plug in minus one there? Uh, by the way, don't, don't yell at me yet. These, these equal signs are sort of rather nebulous right here. Uh, but if you plug in minus one into the series, you would get one plus two plus three plus four plus five. Uh, clearly something that diverges to infinity, everything is positive. But if you look at the analytic continuation, the analytic continuation can be computed out for the value of minus one, and there you get the value of minus one twelfth, which is why the sort of this infamous formula can sometimes be uh, written down. Well, I I'm gonna get rid of it uh, right away so that uh, I, I don't get anyone yelling at me in the comments. But for the purposes of this video, all I'm really trying to say here is that this really is this launching pad for a lot more really deep mathematics. And in fact, it contains one of humanity's you know, one of the top and greatest unsolved problems that we have, a problem that the, uh, the Clay Institute has called a millennium problem and would give a million dollars for somebody to solve it, and nobody has done that. And that's called the Riemann hypothesis. And I can state it relatively quickly here, given what we've done. It basically says that the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function, the, the z of s that I had 
in its domain of convergence, but then extended via analytic continuation, then the hypothesis is that this has a bunch of non-trivial zeros, and all those non-trivial zeros occur when the real component has the value of a half. Outside of just stating it, the point is that the Riemann hypothesis really deeply connects into questions about the distribution of the prime numbers. And so knowing the answer to the Riemann hypothesis would really give some insight in how this distribution of prime numbers actually works. And so these are the reasons why I think that the Euler product formula should be on any short list of the most beautiful equations in mathematics. It's not just a surprising result that can be stated using elementary mathematical operations. It's not just that it has this beautiful proof. It's not just that it extends our prior knowledge about, say, there being infinitely many primes. It's just that it really opens this door to this entire field of analytic number theory and some of the deepest problems in mathematics that humanity has ever faced behind it. Now, if you want to get better at mathematics, then I would strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant helps you learn by doing. It has thousands of lessons across mathematics, computer science, AI, and more. And I'm a fan of Brilliant for three main reasons. Firstly, it's just really interactive. You are the one in the driver's seat actually doing all the mathematics. Second, it builds up learning in layers, so you can be confident with your understanding on one step before you're jumping into the next one. And finally, it consistently is providing feedback and opportunities to self-assess. One of the biggest challenges that I've experienced as a professor trying to help students learn mathematics is that it's easy to sit back and watch a YouTube video or a lecture and think that you've got it, but it's not until you've had that opportunity to really self-assess it and do the mathematics yourself that you can really know whether you've actually mastered it. And so for these reasons, I'm very proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, oh, that's me, or the link is down in the description, to try everything that they have for free for a full 30 days or to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, I wanna ask you, what's your favorite math equation, leave it down in the comments, and we'll do some more math in the next video.